morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're watching or listening to us, welcome to the 22 Dropouts. We are a, a little bit of an off-the-wall show and a podcast. We've got a very special guest for you today. Joining us is prob probably one of the world's most high-profile female sports presenters. You know her as the voice of rugby, the voice of snooker, the voice of four Olympics. It's Jill Douglas. Hi, Jill. How are you? Very well. Lovely to see you. What haven't you done? In sport, seriously, I, I, I've only listed a little bit of the things that you do, but what you do is huge. Well, I don't know if I'm one of the books well known. I think I float a little bit below the radar, but I have had a very, very um, wonderful experience and, and career covering sport all over the world. So I've been very fortunate uh, to do what I do, um, but I like to think I sort of float a little bit below the radar because I, I just I love what I what I get to do so I've been in sports broadcasting now for well probably too many years to mention I started off in print print newspapers then I worked in regional television news as a reporter and a presenter and then I moved into sport and uh, started presenting rugby special with BBC Scotland and then started covering six well five nations as it was then with, with network BBC in 1990. Seven, 1997. So yeah, I uh, I was already doing some rugby before then. But yeah, it's been a a wonderful career. I've seen the world. I've seen some amazing, amazing performances uh, and wonderful events, uh, and been very lucky to be pitch side or track side or or in a studio at some of these you know, moments that I'll never forget. It's been, it's been I've been very, very lucky. I would say. So out of all of that, if you could pick one moment that is probably the highlight, the sporting highlight of your career. You can say, I was there then, what would it be? It's re do you know that is such a hard question because there are so many wonderful things. You know, before I was even, a, you know, when I was still at school, I remember going to see um, Scotland win the Grand Slam in 1984 uh, on the terraces just as a kid. That was a hugely exciting moment. And again, in 1990, I was there. But, but I would say, you know, as a broadcaster, the big ones are the London Olympics. That was just a, you know, a once in a lifetime experience. Um, the whole country got behind it. Uh, and I, I was in Paris 10 days before when Bradley Wiggins won the Tour de France. And I followed Brad's career from his first world title on the track back in 2003. So to have seen the way he progressed, to see him win the Tour de France was very special. And then to come into London, and see Chris Hoy win that sixth gold medal, uh, you know, and to have seen him win his first gold medal at the 2004 Olympics in Athens. So cycling has been a big part of it, but I would say from a rugby perspective, I think probably one of the best trips, one of the best tours ever would have been the, the 2003 World Cup in Australia. That was an incredible time to be following the fortunes of England, obviously. And uh, that was a great trip as well. I was there with five lives. So, those kind of stick out and, and I'm going to mention one other because it was just again such a special special day it was when Mark Cavendish won the rainbow jersey in Copenhagen uh, in 2011 at the World Road Championships uh, a brilliant team performance with Geraint Thomas, Bradley Wiggins, Chris Rumel riding for him, David Miller and so uh, you know when he crossed the line I mean, I was cut my hands over my eyes, couldn't watch. It was a big sprint finish after something like eight hours in the saddle. And and then he came in and did an interview with me straight afterwards. And it was amazing. So, yeah, some, some big moments. Um, and, and most of them revolve around either cycling or, or some of the great rugby that I've been able to see. So how's... How's the lockdown treating you? Because of course we're we're all out of uh, out to the frame at the moment as as officials or anything to do in sport. How have you been keeping your time busy? Um, well, I've got two kids at home, uh, so we're homeschooling. Uh, although it's half term at the moment, but uh, and potentially my daughter, who's in year six, might go back to school next week. We'll have to wait and see how that plays out. Um, so I've been, you know, making sure they're happy and online and doing what they need to do but they're pretty good actually the school both their schools and um, the prep school and the, the senior school that my son attends are brilliant they do lots of live lessons so that That's kind cool. of takes up some of my time um making sure they're fed and watered and my husband carl who also works in rugby so he's a, a coach and he's obviously not working at the moment either so he's doing a lot of training so he he goes off on his bike or he is on the rowing machine or whatever so i'm making sure everybody's got enough food and i'm, making, I'm quartermaster 
chief cook. I'm not going to say bottle washer. I'll let Carl do some of the jobs around the house. And uh, I've been doing some podcasts. I work for Gallagher Insurance, uh, sponsors of the Premiership. So I've been doing some work with them. I've worked in the insurance business in tandem with my, my broadcasting for the last sort of six, seven years. And I've been running. I've been going for big long walks. My step count has gone through the roof and I have been clearing, clearing out cupboards and but just enjoying the sunshine. And, you know, it is a time that people are so, you know, it's a concerning time for so many people because, you know, people have lost their lives. They've been away from their families. They're worried about the future. You know, financially, you know, everyone is, is facing quite difficult times. But at the same time, we'll never get this time back, will we? So trying to just enjoy the moment and stop, not worry too much about everything else. So it's been a, it's been a sort of really reflective time. And of course, as you mentioned, I, I, I work with them. Um, my name's Doddy Foundation and that, that the work there just never stops. So it's, I, I tell you what, I am, I've been busy. <laughs> That's what I'd say. I, I look as if I sat in the sun for the last two months, but <laughs> I've done a lot of work on the laptop in the garden. It's, quite, it's funny how it's worked, isn't it? The, the, uh, during, the, during the pandemic and that, it's like the busiest and the fittest that people have ever become, I think, you know, with everything that's going on, it's crazy. It is a little bit, and I've quite enjoyed getting out for a run in the morning because sometimes that's the, sort of the only sort of me time, if you like. So I, I've been enjoying that, um, and the weather's been brilliant, so it's been quite pleasant. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, just kind of taking time to sort out, you know, things that you never have time to look at. So, uh, you know, just trying to work through some bits and pieces and, and make sure that, you know, everything's in order, your paperwork and cupboards. I don't know. I, it's, been, it's been an interesting time. Obviously, the lack of sport is is difficult for all of us and I was meant to be flying to Tokyo in the middle of July for the Olympics going back after I had two brilliant months there last year so I was looking forward to that that's obviously gone um a lot of the big cycling events that I would have been working on they've gone the rugby's gone as well obviously uh, I, I work with BT Sport as well so yeah all of that's disappeared but next week I'm back on uh, ITV with some live snooker the first uh, bit of live sport come back um in lockdown in the uk and i'll be presenting that from home super so you, you're trying to balance boxes up and down so that your key light, lights are up and your cameras are at different angles i, I know exactly where you're coming from yeah, absolutely I'm, I'm hoping some kit arrives soon and it all makes sense it'll need to be reasonably straightforward if i'm going to manage it i'll be saying that <laughs> the year old son is pretty tech savvy so i'm sure he'll sort me out uh, a burgeoning career for him, I'm sure. Uh, now, you did mention uh, the work you do for uh, the Doddy Weir Foundation, and Sam is uh, sporting the Doddy, the Doddy shirt today over in Malta. Now, that's something that's really close to our hearts as well as to yours, Jill. Uh, I know you work really closely with the, uh, with the Doddy Weir Foundation. Um, we'd lo love you to tell us a bit more about the work, uh, what, uh, what the focus is for the foundation at the moment, and, uh, and your plans for the future as well. Yeah, well, we're, we're kind of two and a half years in to the foundation. So we launched in uh, November 2017. Uh, and really, as a result of Doddy, obviously sharing the fact that he had motor neuron disease and, and he was frustrated at the, the lack of options, the lack of um, hope given to patients because there is no cure, there's no effective treatment. And, and uh, he felt he wanted to do something and he realised he had an opportunity to, to do something. Uh, because of his profile um, and he's he's unbelievable I mean I speak to him most days and he's a long-term friend of ours you know I've known him since I was in my early teens my husband you know, played rugby with him he was our best man and you know he's, he's family and I, I it amazes me all the time how positive he is and he, he just is so you know what you see is what you get that kind of um, fun figure and but at the same time he's quite um, driven to what he wants to do he's very determined to make a difference and to have some kind of legacy and so the foundation has been uh, raising funds thanks to some amazing amazing incredible people um, extraordinary people who've done all sorts of amazing things over the last two and a half years to help us and we are investing in research to try and find a cure for MND and supporting some amazing uh, research projects uh, and in addition to that we give funds to um, families living with MND to, to help them live as best a life as they can in, in these terrible, devastating circumstances. So um, we've invested four million pounds into research, research projects, um, at centres of excellence wow. across the country. And it's a huge responsibility when you are raising that kind of money to make sure you direct it in the right way. So 
at, quite early on, we went out to the, the scientific community, uh, the neurological community, and, and we established what we now call our scientific advisory board. And we had, our, we had a Zoom board meeting actually just last week where we have professors and neurologists come together and they explain what's happening and we challenge them and we ask them some difficult questions. Doddy always asks them some very difficult questions about why is things happening not more why is it not happening more quickly? Why is this not happening? Why is that? And, and it is fantastic to hear these amazing people and they, they, they know what's going on in this space across the world and they update us in recent papers and any projects that, that are underway. And um, that's how we decide how to spend our money. And we have a, a medical strategy lead, a guy called Sean McGrath, who's brilliant and he liaises with them. So we, we put money into these different projects. And um, we really, our big focus is to bring clinical trials to fruition we want people who are given this diagnosis to feel as though they're part of a clinical trial which is something you'd expect if you were diagnosed with cancer but with MND it's just not the case so we've been helping with that so we've got different projects we've been investing in a big one MND smart trials you may have read about or heard about sure. launched in January sadly that's had to halt for a moment while we're in the, the, the COVID-19 situation but hopefully that'll pick up again and then we've also given somewhere in the region of £750,000 to families in direct grant aid um, and that's helped with all sorts of things um, when people maybe need to adapt their homes for uh, to make it um, easier for them to, to live at home or uh, access to different uh, therapies or maybe a chair an electric chair and we used, instead of us deciding how that money go, uh, is spent, because it takes quite a lot of due diligence and you need occupational therapists, et cetera, we uh, work with MND Association and MND Scotland to help um, distribute the money and make sure it goes to the right people and, and gives them the best help they, that they need. So it's, it's busy. Um, at the moment, all of our events and all of our fundraising has stopped because we obviously have not got golf days and rugby matches. We had the Doddy Weir Cup was cancelled, the Scotland Wales match down in Cardiff that went. We had a match organised with Celtic, a football charity match that's been postponed. Uh, we've had numerous golf days postponed, rugby matches, cycle rides, the great rugby cycle. We've turned that into a quiz on a Friday night, which is great. So we've, we're, we've taken quite a hit in the fact that we're not fundraising at the moment but at the same time the trustees led by Scott Hastings our um, chairman and includes like John Jeffrey and and Kathy Doddy's wife Stuart Weir and um, we've basically decided rather than trying to keep fundraising that space maybe is better taken by frontline charities who are delivering care at this really difficult time so we've we're taking a, a sort of breath if you like and then we're going to ramp things up again into July when it's Doddy's 50th birthday. So we're going to do something special around that. Watch this space. And, and is there any, any little secrets or tidbits you can tantalise us with on, on Doddy's 50th? Well, I, we've got another meeting about it this week, but I suspect it'll have to be something remote, done remotely. And Doddy, of course, is shielded because for him to um, become yeah. suffering from COVID-19, you know, it would be, it would have very grave uh, impact the body. So we've got one or two ideas. Uh, we've got um, we've got a cycle of um, challenge coming up, but also lots of I think he likes a wee glass or something. So we might do a little um, cheers for Doddy, but we'll we'll work that one out. And then of course in November it'll be our third anniversary. So we've got a couple of big milestones to look forward to, and we'll and we're committed to doing what we want to do, which is find a cure for MND, help these amazing people who are working to that end, uh, and keep supporting families. And a, and when we when we eventually come out of lockdown and we start getting that fundraising again, how can people get a bit more involved? So um, our website is the best spot. Um, my name's Doddy Foundation. Have a look for us online. You'll find us that uh, my name's the, the S on the name is of number five, which is Doddy's playing number. So you can find us online. Um, we've got brilliant digi digital partners who help us with that. We've got um, social media. We're on Instagram, Twitter. Facebook so you, you, you know you can find us quite easily and if anybody's got any ideas or wants to get in touch you can contact us through the website uh, Kenny Logan and his team support us hugely with organizing bits you know a lot of our activities so you know we, we do okay we're, we're we're looking forward to getting things back underway um, and you know we're really confident that we'll have a bit of fun in July with the big man's birthday and, and then just see things slowly begin to ramp up all of our fundraisers have said they've postponed, they've not cancelled, they've got lots of events coming up. So that's brilliant. Good. 
I had a look at the the website uh, some 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 time ago, and uh, you know it's very useful and very informative as well. And but the best part for me was the the the, the write the name Dodcast, where you can uh, listen to the, the the different programs in it. It's like a sort of diary, if you like, of what's been done and what's going to happen and what we're looking to do and things like that. And it's been absolutely brilliant, actually, just listening to it. Um, look forward to hopefully the next one um, yeah. when that comes out next year. I think the last one was in April, wasn't it? it came yeah, out we, I think we're going to do one um, probably in the next, well, if not this week, maybe next week. But I think yeah. it's a really good way of Doddy sharing his experiences and particularly with um, other people who have got motor neuron disease yeah. because he's very honest and open I mean and very frank about what what life is like for him now um, and he is really really well I should say that uh, um, you know he's out on his tractor and he's um, it's, that, you know, it's, that, it's that red wine and Guinness isn't it that's what it's it is what saying, what saying. Um, but he's now he's doing it ever so well and uh, but yeah we'll do another Dodcast soon because it is a really uh, it is a great vehicle for just talking directly to people and we've our lovely supporters Aberdeen Standard Investments help us with that so yeah look out for our next Dodcast which is we you know we think it's we think we're brilliant. Brilliant. absolutely brilliant the name is really good <laughs> Um, I did read that there were, as well as those clinical trials, there were some other breakthroughs uh, in uh, in the research at the moment. How are they coming along? Yeah, it's small incremental steps, really. But um, there, I think probably in the last five years, there's been a more acceleration in the, the developments and the breakthroughs than there has been probably in the last 30 years as a result of a better understanding of the human genome. So gene therapy um, uh, has really changed the game i think when it comes to neurological um diseases and also stem cell therapy so there's a couple of stem cell therapy projects up in edinburgh um now i'm not an, an, an expert a neurologist but i listen to these very very clever people and and it does make me feel encouraged i feel you know very positive that they are really working very very hard and in, in the right direction and you know, it, it, it will come left field, I suspect. It will it might come as a result of research into some other area. We just don't know. But I believe things will move. And, you know, the fact that we've even got clinical trials happening is just amazing. And, and we, we've also invested some money in drug repurposing, which is where they take existing licensed drugs and they test them with MND cells, that the stem cells they've been able to create in the, in the laboratory. So there's a lot happening. Um, and we try and share as much of that as we can and i think actually it's something maybe is the foundation we can do a little bit more with which is maybe sharing some and because we get lots of um people asking about different things they've read about online and on seen on the news and and we're not experts but we do have access to some amazing experts so maybe that's something we might look at doing as well Now, um, one of the things that I did want to ask you, a bit away from uh, the foundation, is what happened with Josh Lucy at Balmoral? <laughs> no, not at Balmoral, at the oh. Balmoral. So oh, you... at the Balmoral. Oh, the Balmoral Hotel, yes, of course yeah, not. Talk about, I'll never mention anything. For, for those people. Uh, the Balmoral stories are well off the... Off the... <laughs> no, at the Balmoral. So when, whenever I'm asked about my most embarrassing experience, and, and do you know what I... I am embarrassed on a daily basis, I think, and but not nearly as embarrassed as my daughter is because I embarrass her on a daily basis too. But I'm trying, you know, I, I seem to lurch from one embarrassing escapade to the next. But I would say possibly one of my most embarrassing would be at the Balmoral Hotel the day after Scotland England match, and I had been working on the match on the on the Saturday. And I was booked on the Sunday to go to the Balmoral Hotel and interview Josh Lucy for grand, a Sunday grandstand. So in the, those days, we used to have a Sunday grandstand and they wanted some kind of reflective interview with somebody from the England squad on the morning after the game. So in typical um, Murrayfield fashion, I went out after the match and had a right old good night in Edinburgh with all my mates, as you do, <laughs> and then went to bed and sort of fell into bed and then had to get up really early and go to the Balmoral to record this interview. So I, my alarm went off and I realised I'd completely slept in, jumped out of bed, threw my clothes on that were lying on the floor, went straight to the interview, did the interview with Josh Lucy, who may I say was as rough as I was, and we, we finished the interview and we got up and we, we were walking back through the lobby of the 
Balmoral and he was waiting to get on the team bus to go back to the airport and the entire England team were sort of milling around the lobby and as I walked I, something caught my leg and I sort of shook my leg out I had a pair of flip-flops on and I sort of shook my leg thinking something stuck in my leg <laughs> which point my underwear which had been trapped sometime down my trouser leg at some, from the day before shot out the bottom of my jeans and <laughs> Flew across the floor in amongst the England rugby team. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I immediately realised what happened and sort of without even stopping or st I didn't break my stride. I just walked, I knelt down very quickly, scooped them up in my hand, shoved them in my pocket, kept walking and said, thank you very much. And just kept going, never looked back, never <laughs> mentioned it again. <laughs> I'm outside. I am not kidding. I was hysterical. I mean, I was genuinely hysterical for quite a long time after. I thought, I've just th thrown my pants at the entire England team. Oh, my goodness me. I can't believe I've told you that. But anyway, there you are. That, that, that is, whenever I think of being embarrassed, that is right up there as one of the most embarrassing. And whether anybody ever spotted it, I don't know. They were all too far too, uh, like, gentlemen to ever mention it. Probably thought it was like a figment of their imagination or something, or being hung oh over. Oh my lord! <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that's probably the, that's, that's probably a perfect place to end the interview. To be fair, I don't know how we can top that. <laughs> oh dear! There we go. Yes, it's I, I, I do suppose. I mean, you've been you've been incredibly open and honest there, Jill. Thank you for that. It's it's quite unusual for this show, um, but. On air, we, I have incredibly embarrassing moments that usually get filmed and put on this show uh, from when I'm officiating. Uh, yeah, he's nodding. Yeah, <laughs> like dropping my flag at Twickenham and just holding my hand in the air instead of a flag. Yeah. But um, yeah, that's quite embarrassing as well. Um, so on air, what's the uh, what's your funniest or almost horrendous moment that you can remember? I've, I have what they call corpsing, you know, when you just lose it on air. And I've done that a few times and not not very often and almost always with a guy called Neil Folds, who is my uh, brilliant punter on the snooker. And Neil Folds is, without a shadow of doubt, one of the driest, funniest men I have ever known. And he regularly makes me laugh out loud and be unable to speak. But that And that's always just a little bit silly. But I would say... Um, one of the sort of really awkward moments was in uh, in um, at Murrayfield and I was interviewing Simon Danielli on the pitch after Scotland had just beat Italy I think and Simon had scored and he'd been a while he hadn't scored a try and he'd just scored he'd scored in the match he might have scored a couple of tries actually so I was interviewing him and it was that awful that awful interview where you're interviewing him for television but it's actually going out in the stadium as well so you get a bit of a reverb as well and it's a very unnatural thing to be doing it just feels a bit odd but I was standing on the pitch we sort of walked out with the crew and I said to him you know great to get a win it's been a long time coming Simon you know how pr proud are you with the performance blah 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 great to get a try on the board yes, 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 yes and then for some unknown reason so he was playing for Ulster, Ulster at the time for some unknown reason that I still have no idea why I did this I said to him and of course, great, the crowd are all behind you here and the crowd are all cheer, 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 because they can hear me. And I said, and you'll so look forward to seeing them on a more regular basis when you sign for Glasgow next season. And he looked at me in, and he just blank. And he said, no, I haven't signed for Glasgow next season. And there was sort of, you could hear the sort of murmuring in the crowd. And I said, oh, and then I thought, really? And I says, but wow, you were thinking about it, weren't you, Simon? You, you were thinking about it. And he went, no. No, re signed for Ulster. <laughs> and I thought it was the most, I was stunned. I was like, and everybody started laughing. It was, and people in my ear were going, right, Jill, leave it there. Leave it. I stood back, <laughs> stunned. I was, I was completely like, what have I just done? I've just made a, anyway, I, I couldn't speak. And my floor manager said, you need to go in the tunnel and do some more interviews. And I said, I can't believe I've just done that. Not just in front of. 80,000 people at Murrayfield, 70,000 people at Murrayfield, in front of 5 million people at home. Anyway, that later on in the post-match function, Simon came up to me and he said, I am so sorry, Jill. I almost agreed with you just because it felt so awkward. But he said, I couldn't because I knew my coach, Elster, would be watching. You think, what's she talking about? And the whole, it, honestly, 
Simon Taylor still would go on about it now if he sees me. It was funny. It was funny. At the, well, it wasn't funny at the time, but I was very embarrassed. And actually, my editor said afterwards, when I came back to the trucks, I said, I'm really sorry about that. I don't know what happened. And he said, oh, yeah, you knew more there than he was ever willing to let on. So they believed me. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's, that's a fantastic. Absolutely, I, this is exactly what stuff in rumor, our rumor mill is made up of. And we're not yeah. going to put you on the spot today. Normally, Jill, we do put our, uh, our guests on the spot and ask them for something that they've heard on the grapevine. But we know you're far too professional to do that. Uh, and uh, if you watch the show, you'll know some of our weird and wonderful rumours, which will never come true, but they're good fun at the time. Um, well, that's about all we've got time for today. Jill, that's been wonderful to see you. Thank you very much for giving up your time. I'm sure that uh, the kids wouldn't have mind you doing it uh, last week when you could have taken half an hour off homeschooling and they could have had an extra break. But uh, do stay safe, stay well, uh, and do come and join us and, and tell us, uh, more about Doddy Weir in the future, won't you? Love to. Thank you very much. Same to no, you guys. Thanks, Joe. You take care. Bye bye now. Don't forget to go and check out all the great work from the Doddy Weir Foundation at uh, my name, then the figure five Doddy dot co dot uk. Look at all the great work they're doing, how they're helping people with MND, what you can do uh, after lockdown to support the foundation, and all of the charity rides, games, quizzes, and everything else, and also the uh, the fantastic Doddy merchandise that you can buy. Don't forget as well to tune in to the wonderful. Dodcast. Don't forget you can follow us uh, here at 22 Dropouts by checking out our social media channels on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Just search for at 22 Dropouts.